This lesson is for FST Lesson 3.1 on 8 Parent Functions. When students open their textbook, they'll be able to see that there are 8 graphs pictured. In class, students would have been given time to create 8 flashcards, one for each of the 8 graphs pictured. Students should place the graphs on one side of the flashcard and the name and the equation on the other. As students maneuver through the chapter, they should also include additional pieces of information on their flashcards. Things like symmetry and whether or not the equation or the graph contains any asymptotes. So let's take a look at the first four which are pictured here. Keep in mind that the goal for students should be to be able to recognize these simply by name or by equation or by graph. So all three of those pieces of information should be something that students should be memorizing throughout the chapter. When you see the graph of a line, you should know that the equation for that is simply y equals x, and that it's called a linear equation and a linear graph. The next graph is of a parabola. The parabola is the name of the shape of the graph, so that could be an additional piece of information that students include. The equation that forms that shaped graph is called a quadratic, and the equation itself is y equals x squared. When students are copying the names here, they don't need to include the parentheses. I'm not quite sure why the book has those there. For the cubic equation, students can simply think about it like a parabola that's been twisted. Normally, this part of the graph should be located up here, but because negative exponents can be resulted from taking something to the third power, that second arm of the parabola gets twisted down into quadrant 3. The square root function could potentially have another arm or another branch that reaches down here, and we'll talk later on in the chapter about why that is omitted here. The other four equations are the two inverse equations, the regular one called the inverse, has a graph whose name is the hyperbola. The other graph here, I call it the volcano, is the inverse square graph. Absolute value is a nice V-shaped graph. Keep in mind that on the calculator, students will need to utilize the command ABS in order to do the absolute value. These bars are very difficult to find on the menus that are available, so students should ask questions in class about how to find the ABS command. The exponential growth equation we looked at in the last chapter as AB to the X. Here the parent graph is simply going to be 2 as your base to the X. Keep in mind that symmetry is something that students should be thinking about or considering for these graphs as well as which ones have asymptotes and which ones do not. And so that is discussed in class, and if students have questions about that, they are welcome to ask. Some other things about graphing is that when students are using their graphing calculator, they need to make sure that they're choosing a good window. A good window will contain all of the intercepts that a graph contains, including both x and y intercepts. A graph with a good window will show the proper behavior of the graph. Behavior simply means how the graph behaves. How is the graph looking? When you're looking at a graph, for example, like the absolute value graph, if you can't see in your window where that final vertex point is or where the V closes, then that's not a good graph, not a good window, because you want to be able to identify all the parts of the graph. If you choose a window for something on like the hyperbola graph and you can only see the first branch in quadrant 1 and the other branch in quadrant 3 is missing, again, that would not be a good window. This graph of 1 over x should contain two branches, and your window should contain both. Again, if a graph has asymptotes, those should be easily visible in the window that you choose, as well as any endpoints that the graph may contain. The homework refers students to what kind of a default window their, their calculator has. And on the TI Inspire, the default window is simply from negative 10 to 10 for x, and from negative 6 and 2 thirds to positive 6 and 2 thirds for y.
the default window or the standard window on a TI-83 or 84, which students may be using, is simply from negative 10 to 10 for both X and Y. If students need assistance with their default window, they are more than welcome to ask questions of their teacher in class. Finally, graphs are sometimes described as being either continuous or discontinuous. And all that students need to remember there is, if it's discontinuous, you have to lift your pencil to draw it. So for example, the hyperbola is a discontinuous graph. In order to draw both branches, students must lift their pencil. Where the parabola graph is continuous, you are able to draw that with one swipe of your pencil. To illustrate choosing a good window and how that affects a graph, I would like students to try number 10 from the homework. Students will simply type in on their graphing calculator x to the third minus x and then they're going to modify the window in four different ways to see how the graph looks. A quick review on how to modify the window. On a TI-83 you simply hit the window button. On a Inspire calculator you'll need to hit the menu button and then you'll see that there are choices for window or window zoom as well as window settings. When you're looking at the window settings, the minimum number is the lower and the maximum number is the upper. So students should go ahead and give this a try right now on their calculator. Try graphing all four of these by modifying the window. Notice that the graph will look different for each window and students should record their results. For example, when you graph this one, draw your graph with a box around it. Whenever your graph has a box around it, that tells me as your instructor that you did indeed graph this on the calculator and not by hand. You should also include your window according to the axes. And when you graph it, you should get something that looks about like that. Students don't need to make it perfect, but they should make it fairly accurate. You'll notice that when you graph this, that the top of this mountain and the bottom of that valley do not meet at about halfway. They're a little bit below halfway through that quadrant. So it is important that students try to be fairly accurate, even though you can clearly see that my graph isn't symmetric like it's supposed to be. So students should take a moment right now to graph this, and then they can continue the video and see the answers below. So here's the equation again, x cubed minus x. When I graphed it with a negative 1 to 1, I got this graph. From negative 5 to 5, see how the graph changed. And simply what happened was we looked at a bigger portion of the graph. So we were able to see more of the graph's behavior. Similarly for this one, when we went negative 10 to 10, we can clearly see what the graph is doing. The last one is a little bit too large of a window. Going from negative 100 to 100 doesn't really give a good indication of what this graph is doing. Clearly on this picture we cannot see that the graph has three x-intercepts. It really only looks like it has one. So I would say if I had to choose a good window between these four, there would probably be a good tie between number two and number three. What I like about number two is it's easier to identify where the top of that mountain hits and where the bottom of that valley hits. We can easily identify that from the scale that's given. What I like about number three is that it's clear to see here that it cro the x-intercepts are crossing at negative one, zero, and one. What I don't like about this one is it's a lot more difficult to identify how tall that mountain gets and how low that valley gets, where number two might be a little bit more difficult to identify those x-intercepts. So there's pros and cons between number two and number three, but I would consider them both fairly decent windows. Students who graphed similar to number two or number three would get full credit. Students who chose a window like number one or number four would only get partial credit. On number one, you can clearly see what's happening as you've zoomed in, but you can't see that the graph does continue beyond what looks like these endpoints. Finally, students need to look at asymptotes, and that is something that they may be asked to identify. Typically when you're graphing something, you can identify the, as the horizontal asymptotes very easily as y equals a number. Identify where the y-intercept is, and you can indicate the horizontal asymptote. 
Students will develop their skill eventually on identifying vertical asymptotes algebraically as x equals a number. I'm able to look at this equation right now and simply say where the vertical asymptote would be, and that is something that students will be working towards in this chapter. This equation comes from the parent function 1 over x, which is a hyperbola. Hopefully students are starting to get comfortable memorizing what the original graph would have looked like. Since there's this inclusion of another number down here with x, we know that the bottom of this fraction cannot be 0. So if we think about what value of x would turn the bottom of this fraction into a 0, we know that the value x, if it were a 1, would become 0. You can't have 1 divided by 0, so x can't be the number 1. So that turns into our new asymptote. So when students graph it, just to give them another picture here of what's happening in this equation. If you graph this equation, the asymptote has shifted from the y-axis over to 1. So that's why the vertical asymptote is now at 1. We're going to learn more details about why this graph has been shifted and why it moves that direction. But that is something I wanted students to take note of when they're looking at asymptotes. It is easy for students, or it will become easy for students, to identify where they are simply by thinking about how the graph has been shifted. The horizontal asymptote has not changed, and that remains at y equals 0 on the x-axis. So the vertical one is at x equals 1, the horizontal one is at, x, at y equals 0.